as we go throughout these different uh, objects, different works of art, I want to think about why dogs are included. Um, you're all, most of you are dog people, so it may seem natural to you, but um, it's not always just because it's the family pet. Sometimes they are a signifier of status or they symbolize something else. Um, so we'll think about the different reasons why artists may have chosen to include dogs or why the patrons, the sitters of the portraits may have asked to have their dog included. So we're going to start with this uh, painting here. This is currently on view in our gallery six at the museum. And I want to give you just a moment to look at it. And my first question for you is, what is the family dynamic here in this portrait? And I should mention too, if you are new to these programs, feel free to just unmute yourself and join in verbally. Or if you prefer, you can share things via the chat um, and my colleague Kathleen will convey those to the group. They don't look real happy. They don't look real happy. Okay. And Kay, what do you see that makes you say they don't look really happy? Um, well, the younger boy's looking off one way, the daughter's looking off. I guess there's a family. Um, the one son is actually looking at us, the one that the dog is mm -hmm. kind of smelling, I guess. And the dad looks kind of stern mm -hmm. and there's no mom. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you're kind of sketching out the, the familial landscape for us. You've noticed right away there's an absence of a mother figure. You've identified this as the younger brother who's looking kind of askance. The, the daughter doesn't seem to be looking at anyone in particular either. Interestingly, this older boy is looking at us and you've noticed too, he's the one the dog is giving attention to and the father is very stern. So yeah, I think, I think that's a good assessment. Um, but any other kind of takes or um, assessments of this family dynamic here? Laura Faith shared that it looks patriarchal. Ah, patriarchal. Yeah, I think, I think as Kay mentioned too, you know, the, the stern father who's literally towering over the rest of the family in the center, a very strong presence. I see the patriarchy at work right here for sure. <laughs> uh, Jim, were you going to add something? No, but the, I, it's very noticeable that the mother's not there. There's mm -hmm. Yeah, for whatever for whatever reason, it's the father and his children. Exactly, exactly. It's this very palpable absence, I think, of the mother. Um, and we we assume, of course, we can't know for sure because we don't know who this family is. But we assume the mother has passed away um, because traditionally, at this time, you know, in the mid fifteen hundreds, um, a family portrait would have included the mother, the father, and the children. Or if it was going to be um, a separate kind of pendant portraits, there would have been the father and the sons in one painting, the mother and the daughters in the other painting. So the fact that we have both genders of children represented here indicates to us most likely that um, the mother is no longer with them. Okay, so kind of a somber portrait. Oh, Howard, yeah, jump in. Uh, yeah, the, uh, well, we've identified the, uh, the man in the center as being stern and I agree with that, that viewpoint. Uh, there is some tenderness going on. You can see the daughter is kind of holding his hand there on the left side. So there, there you know, appears to be a, a loving relationship there. It's not uh, harsh. Great point, Howard. Yeah, so this detail, and I can zoom in. You know, I love a good zoom. Um, there's this kind of confluence of hands where the little, the little boy has his hand here. It doesn't seem to be holding on to really anything, but the daughter and the father, uh, their hands are connected here. Um, but I'm curious, I think, Faith, you said this was patriarchal. Do you also read this as a gesture of affection or does this seem a little bit controlling to you? I'm <laughs> curious. <laughs> we'll give Faith a moment if she wants to share via chat. Um, but other, any other kind of thoughts? Uh, anyone uh, want to chime in with Howard's comment that there is some tenderness, um, some familial affection here? Does everyone agree with that? Laura, this is Donna. Um, I love... Howard's observation. I think the young lady, the, the daughter, has a look of perhaps melancholy or resignation on her face. Mm -hmm. And she's very bejeweled and dressed, as are the other children, so beautifully that I'm almost wondering if she knows she's going to um, have to make a marriage, uh, an alignment at some point. Um, that her father will select for her because she just seems to be um, portrayed as um, wealthy and probably um, a desirable marriage partner for someone. 
Yeah, Donna, that's a great point. And I'm always uh, taken by this gesture where she's um, sort of the, the top level of her skirt to reveal another beautiful, um, you know, fabric underneath. So yes, very, very richly dressed. She's got these beautiful glass beads that were um, very, very common in Venice. Um, as well as a pearl necklace, and she's all you know ornamented very richly. Um, so yes, I think I think that's a really interesting assessment is that she's sort of being presented, if not presenting herself, um, sort of for consumption. But her face maybe is telling a little bit of a different story. Um, and it's it's interesting, you know, it's hard to know exactly how much of their psychology we can read into these expressions because at this time, you know, sort of decorum would have dictated that you would be very somber and serious in your portrait. You know, it was a solemn mm -hmm. occasion. So the fact that they're not smiling is not unusual but to me there's a sort of hauntedness in their eyes um, and and I don't know if it has to do with the absence of the mother or I'm just sort of imposing my own ideas onto it um, but there is that kind of interesting feel to this this portrait and Laura uh, Faith continued to share that it looks a little controlling mm. uh, she wrote I think the kids to the left look like they want to leave and he is stopping them <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Thank you, Faith. Yeah. I mean, even if you look at how his feet are posed, which seems sort of, it's a little bit hard to make out, but there almost is like kind of in a, a stopped position where he's stepping out in front of the family, um, it, which is again, befits his status as patriarch. But, but Faith is reading that these two kids are trying to maybe wiggle away or they'd rather be somewhere else and he's not allowing that to happen. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Faith. So we've, we've talked about these two. Um, let's go back because this is our dog theme tour. So we have to give some attention to the dog here. Um, and the dog really kind of helps single out this older son um, as sort of a little bit apart from his other two siblings. What do you make of this, this boy here? We've already noted that he's looking directly out at us. Um, any other kind of observations or what, what's your read on him? Yeah, Howard, jump in. Yeah, he uh, appears to be the heir apparent to me. Um, you know, he's well-dressed. He looks to have uh, like a little sword in his uh, belt there. And uh, so I would read the relationship between, you know, he and, and the dog as maybe that's, uh, you know, family, favorite family pet and, and the dog is, has been more or less raised by him. And so there's a, a relationship between the, the dog and the young man. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right. And I can again, I'll zoom it a little bit. Um, I know it gets a little pixelated, but it's hard to make out. But you can actually see his other hand here sort of stroking the dog's ear. So, you know, on the on the side that is presented more formally, the side that we more easily see, he is the master of this dog. He's holding it on a short leash, right? And the dog is giving him the attention. But then there's this little tender moment where he's also sort of stroking the dog's ear. So to me, that does indicate that they have you know, sort of a, a pet and owner relationship. Um, and, you're, and you're right, he's got this little dagger here, which I wouldn't necessarily give any uh, 14 or 15 year old boy, but uh, at the time it probably was meant to be used in parrying if you were, were fencing. Um, so again, befitting his, his status as a wealthy um, elite member of society. Um, so what about the dog? We, you know, we, we've, we talked about how the dog is sort of jumping up on the boy here. What, what do you make of the dog? Howard says probably he's a pet. Any other, any other takes on what this dog is? Very much a pet. Uh, he's affectionate. And that just isn't allowed, I, I, especially the jumping up, unless this is a really favored pet. Uh, certainly not a work dog would be doing that. And uh, that says quite a bit. Yeah, I think you're right. He's, he's kind of being naughty. Um, which is not something, you know, this is, it wasn't like a, a photograph they took where the dog just happened to be jumping up. This is, again, a very deliberate choice of the artist and the patron. Um, so, yeah, it shows that he's, he's familiar with the boy. He might, he probably is a beloved pet because they're letting him get away with jumping up. Um, and for me, too, just the fact that um, he, it, it almost serves as an arrow in my thinking in the composition to really draw our attention to this figure here that I think Howard said is, is the heir apparent, is the kind of the most significant person in the portrait, perhaps after the father. Um, so it's a kind of a visual signifier of his importance, but also you can read that um, pet relationship in there as well. And Faith also shared that she thinks he is a hunting dog that the boy loves and the boy is con concerned that the father won't like that. Ah, interesting. I like how we're getting some narrative here. Yeah. So, and you can see his muscles. I mean, he's a 
crazily muscled. I mean, maybe more <laughs> kind of larger than life with these muscles here. Um, so probably a hunting dog. And again, that would have been another noble pursuit for a young man in a, a wealthy family to, um, you know, have, have a hunting dog to go out in the hunt and pursue that as a leisure activity. Um, so again, maybe tells us something about the status. Um, but also then we're kind of wondering, is the boy and the dog, do they have a close relationship? Does the father not feel the same way? Um, very interesting. Now that I'm looking at it, it almost looks like he's about to step on his tail. So I wonder if the boy's going to get worried about that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's great. Uh, any other general thoughts about this, this family here or the dog in particular? The boy looks very protective towards the dog. Mm -hmm. And maybe the dog is even competes. Maybe it races. Ah. It's got that greyhound look. It does look very greyhoundy. Yeah. I wonder, this was maybe in Italy in the 1500s. I wonder what the origin of greyhound racing is but perhaps yeah he's a racing dog or a hunting dog or doing something but um yeah that's an interesting point I like that I like that so here the dog probably it, it tells us something about the boy's character right that he is a good owner master to the dog it draws our attention visually to the boy um but what's interesting about this is uh, th this wasn't always the case we've we've done some x-rays of this painting and there used to be three other dogs um, in the mm. image. Now I have the x-ray to show you, and, and sorry, here's the, um, the artist, Fazlo family group, about 1565. Um, it's a quite large painting. It's about life size, if you've seen it in the galleries. Um, and I am not great at reading x-rays. I am no art conservator, but here's the x-ray scan. So there used to be two dogs seated in front of the girl here, which is what these dark shadows are, one facing this way and the other facing this way. So these are the hind haunches of that other dog. And then there was another dog standing here and you can just make out his tail right here going into her skirt. So I don't know, I don't know what that says about the narrative we've constructed about this being the special pet. Um, Maybe the fact that the other dogs were ultimately painted over does indicate that, or maybe the composition was just too cluttered and they had to pick one. Um, so kind of an interesting twist. It's fun to be able to kind of get that story behind what we can see on the surface. <clears throat> and again, when you, and you can actually kind of see it too in the paint, how it's faded over time. So this was the, this is the one dog, this is the other dog, and here's the tail here. So the next time you go look at that painting in person, if you really strain, you can see the shadows of the, the other dogs who didn't make the final cut. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one visible dog, three ghostly dogs. Um, if there are not any other comments or questions about this one, I will move on to our next image of a dog. I'll give you a moment. Any last words about this one? Okay, let me jump ahead. <clears throat> so this is a, a, a big, another, again, almost larger than life uh, painting that is on view in Gallery 11. It was on loan for a year, a couple of years. So it hasn't um, been on view for a while, but it is now back at the museum. And again, I'm just gonna give you a moment to, to look at this one here. And then I'm curious about the sort of range of emotions being depicted here. So as you look at it, What's one word that you would use to describe the mood of this painting? And you can share via the chat or just unmute when you think of your word. Power shared concern. Concern. And faith, faith shared glum. Glum, yeah, concern, glum. Anybody else? Regret. Regret, mm-hmm. Nancy shared somber. Mm -hmm. Somber, sure. Yeah, so this is a really intense scene um, depicting a really intense story. So I know some of you may be familiar with this painting. Um, and if you are, that's great. Feel free to share. If you're not, um, there are some clues as to what's going on that we can suss out together. So what is going on here? We've, got the, we've, we've gotten that sense of mood pretty immediately, but how do we parse out the story? What kind of big clues do we have as to what's going on here? We just have one other share, Laura, and oh, sure. Diane shared uh, fraught. Fraught, ooh, I like that, yeah. Fraught, that kind of sums it up. <laughs> John Anderson is wondering, pregnant woman on the right, question mark. Okay, so as we're thinking about clues to who these people are and what's going on, um, John is wondering if this is a pregnant woman. Um, she definitely 
has a protruding stomach and is kind of gla- grasping her her robes right above that bend, as we see a lot of um, of pregnant women do. So that posture could indicate pregnancy. We'll come back to that that thread in just a moment, but yeah, really interesting observation there, John. Um, what what else is going on here? What other clues do we have in the story? It's a quick exit from someplace. There we have possessions with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a, there's a certain amount of confusion, quite a bit of confusion, but they have to leave, I think. And the women don't seem too happy about having to leave. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so there's some sort of quick exit, perhaps a forced exit that um, they've had to quickly grab what seem to be valuables, right? That looks like gold, um, grab their things and, and just quickly go. And I think that idea of confusion, I, I definitely get that um, from the way that all the different heads are kind of turning. Um, there's that sobriety to it, but also the sense of, of urgency perhaps, or there's a little bit of frenetic energy as well. And Donna uh, shared family valuables in the basket, question mark. So. so perhaps family valuables, yeah, it may be heirlooms or things, things that are precious to the family. Um, Howard, did you want to jump in? Well, I have an unfair advantage because I did this as a spotlight. So, uh, <laughs> oh, excellent! Yeah, Howard is one of our uh, guys at the meeting. Yeah. Unless it's too premature for that. No, Howard, the floor is yours. Yeah. All right. Um, so the uh, the title of this uh, painting, this is a Rubens painting, is called uh, the. Um, Oh, I'm not going to spoil it now. Or I think it's the Lot and his family escape from Sodom, I believe is the title of it. Uh, so the, the central man in the center with the gray hair is, is the biblical character Lot. And uh, the, if you know the story, is that uh, he and his family lived in, um, in kind of an evil place in, in, uh, in Sodom. And there's a lot of bad things going on there. And the angels where, uh, well, God decided he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and the angels were leading Lot and his family away from the destruction um, so that they would be safe. And uh, the woman to uh, Lot's left, it looks kind of sad there, that is his wife, and she is about to make the uh, poor decision of looking back and ultimately being turned into a pillar of salt. Thank you, Howard. Yes, that's it. you've nailed it. That was a very succinct summary. Um, so I know a lot of you are maybe familiar with the story of Lot's wife. She looked back, was turned into a pillar of salt because as they're fleeing, right, in this confusion that Jim mentioned, um, they've been instructed by God, you know, you'll be spared, you can flee, but you cannot look back. And what I think is so interesting in this painting is that Lot's wife is looking straight ahead steadfastly. She doesn't seem to be the one causing trouble. And it's actually Lot who is sort of turning his head um, and then perhaps, but for the, the divine intervention of this angel here who was urging him forward, he may have met that same fate. Um, so yeah, definitely. It, and it's a, it's a, the story goes on. It's a very intense story. The story goes on. So Lot's wife is turned to a pillar of salt. And I think Rubens is sort of acknowledging that here with this column that's behind her, sort of a, a little clue to us as to her fate. Um, so that ultimately it's just Lot and his two daughters so they escape to this cave. Um, they assume the whole world basically has been destroyed, that humanity has ceased to exist. So his two daughters take it upon themselves to get him very drunk. And then one by one, they sleep with him to become pregnant by him so that they can carry on the human race, uh, which is a twist you don't necessarily get from this painting, although maybe John did because he was wondering, you know, is she pregnant? And perhaps there is some sort of illusion here in the stomach that looks as though it is pregnant or will become pregnant um, to, to what happens next in the story. You can also make out two candlesticks. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's, she's kind of wrapped her valuables. So it may just be the, the bulk of um, some of the valuables that she's carrying with, but I think there's that, that confusion or that ambiguity um, <laughs> on purpose. Um, so yeah, that's very, like I said, very intense story. So you may be wondering why am I talking to you about this painting on our dog days tour? Has anyone found the dog? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Here he, he's sort of easy to miss amongst the the chaos and the angst and you know the 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 fraught nature of this painting. And here he is. How would I'll, I'll zoom in on him because he's quite cute. Uh, how would you describe this dog here? The dog is oblivious <laughs> to the plight of the, of the of all the people and is just eagerly forging ahead. Yeah. 
So good that's spaniel. why I think he's so interesting. He's he's just sort of leaping ahead. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's charging unequivocally forward. He seems to have no qualms about what's going on. He's just excited to be out on a walk with his people. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think you can kind of see too, he does have a collar. So he's, I think that's meant to indicate he is a pet. So they're bringing all over their valuable possessions and then this family pet. And there's no mention of a dog in the biblical account. This is something that Rubens has sort of invented and put into the story for us. Why do you think he has done that? I mean, I, I don't I don't know, but I think it's an interesting choice. What do you make of that? Diane shared that dog is the leader, exclamation point. Yeah, the dog, they're all resistant, right? And confused and he's he's leading or she is leading the way. Absolutely, Diane, yeah. Laura, this is Donna. Um, mm -hmm. Many years ago when I was on a tour, not as good as yours, but similar, and it was actually in the Louvre, the um, guide pointed out a dog in a painting that seemed to have nothing to do with the central story. And she brought it to our attention to say, it's a clue about faithfulness. Mm -hmm. And that often in biblical stories, dogs are included in the narrative as a symbol for be it faithfulness um, to God, to family. So I have no idea if that is accurate, but I remember, I just remembered that being shared. Yeah, and Donna, so that's I bring a it up. Point. Yeah, no, that's a, a great point to make because often when we'll see dogs either in portraits or biblical scenes or other narratives, it, they do represent fidelity. So sometimes you'll see like a marriage portrait and they'll have a little dog resting peacefully between them. Um, and, and here I could definitely see it as this idea of, you know, faithfulness to God, God has commanded them to flee even though they're in disarray and, you know, it seems chaotic. Um, you know, the dog is leading the way if they can follow the dog and have that, that faithfulness. Um, I think I think that's a great uh, probably reason why he may have included it. I like to think he had a pet that looked kind of like this and <laughs> wanted to have his dog make a cameo, but I think your reason is probably a little more legitimate. <laughs> I like your reason though too. <laughs> and John Anderson shared Fido is for fidelity. Fidelity. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Fido, fidelity. Yeah. Yeah. Those good faithful dogs. And I'm preaching to the choir here, you know, 80% dog people on the call. <laughs> um, any other comments or things you're noticing, questions about this work of art here? The angel that's to the right of Lot, mm -hmm. look at the finger pointing backwards. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what he's saying. <laughs> that's a good point, Kay. I've never thought yes. about that because you know it's almost like the good angel and the, the devil on your shoulder saying, look back, look back. And this one's saying, no, move forward. But you know, in the story, both angels were sort of good um so that's interesting what what dialogue are they having what are they thinking about what is what is what is that conversation <laughs> and i i should point out too again it doesn't it the vi the virtual you know reproduction doesn't do it justice but when you see this painting in the galleries the drapery in particular the rich colors the highlights it's it's spectacular um and this is a painting by rubens uh probably with some assistance from his workshop but we believe uh that rubens himself painted the faces and then the drapery on the daughters and the mm -hmm. angel here and those really stand out when you see it in person um so that's probably the direct hand of rubens himself so when, when you feel safe and are able to go to the museum in person, this is a good one to see in, in Gallery 11. Hi, Laura. I'd just like to add that we're fortunate enough to own a poster, the Ringling poster of this painting, and we have it in our hallway. It's about three feet by three feet, and I haven't seen those available for 10 years or more, and uh, it's one of our favorite Ringling images. Oh, wonderful. That's great. It's fun when you live with an image and then... Um, get the chance to talk about it because you probably have, have noticed more details than any of us ever have living with it in your hallway. <laughs> awesome. Okay, anything else for this one or we should we can move on to our next our next dog? Okay. Oh, and sorry, I forgot. I neglected to give you uh, the information, although Howard covered it for us. Um, okay. So we're returning to portraiture here. Um, and, and like the family portrait that we began with, we actually don't know the identity of this sitter. We don't have a lot of information about it um, at all, but we can guess a little bit about her. Um, so based on what you see in the painting, 
what could we put, what could we possibly guess about this woman who she is what her station in life is what what she's into she's very wealthy <laughs> very wealthy okay yep i think we're probably all on the same page about that one <laughs> What else? She loves to accessorize. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I'm gonna do my zoom in thing so you can see how how detailed she is. So she's got this hair band here with little pearls and the blue lace. She's got big earrings, this extensive lace ruff uh, that of course matches all of the details in her dress. These the lace sleeves um, that will probably be very heavy. The pearl bracelet on both hands. Um, the 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 big ring there and then again this just like very sumptuous lace floral gown so she likes to accessorize for sure she's a fashion plate if you ask me um so what is the role of the dog in this case is this another case of fidelity and if so to whom or to what or is this dog serving a different purpose maybe he's an accessory <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, I kind of think he might be uh, sort of just a little fashion statement. And you'll see even the dog is adorned with this uh, very uh, elaborate red kind of velvet, multiple bows around his or her neck. Uh, so the dog may just be an accessory. Any other any other thoughts on the role of the dog in this this portrait? Yeah, I mean, it may just be as simple as that, right? This is a woman who likes fashion. She likes to dress up. She likes to be trendy. Um, the, the background is pretty standard for portraits of this time. You know, it's a sort of stormy, dramatic background. I don't know that we can read a whole lot into that in terms of understanding this woman, um, but certainly a fashion plate. And, and she's, she's a young woman. I mean, she has her hair powdered gray, which would have been the fashion of the time, but um, she seems to be sort of young. She has that same, sort of that same gesture as the girl in the family portrait where she's holding out her skirt a little bit to reveal the fabric underneath. Um, and this is interesting because this was made during the time of the Rococo period, sort of pre-French Revolution when people were living large and um, have these sort of fantasy lives. If you were wealthy, it was a good, good time to be one of the elite. Um, and Rococo was this aesthetic that began in furniture, very kind of decorative, whimsical, over-the-top furniture, but you see it creeping into to fabrics and textiles. So here she's, you know, she's demonstrating this, this trend for, um, you know, the foliage, the flowers, the beautiful patterns um, that she's, she's embodying, literally. And Faith also shared that the dog is taking the place of a child. Interesting, Faith. Yeah. So maybe because she is a younger woman, maybe she is not married or does not have a child and the dog is maybe, maybe the dog could indicate her own sort of caring nature, right? Um, especially during this time, it would have been considered important for women to be nurturers and, and future mothers. So maybe that's making a little bit of a statement as well. Interesting. Yeah. I can just imagine her throwing this dog in a purse if she lived today and bringing it to every restaurant, even that the ones that said no dogs allowed. And <laughs> John Anderson shared maybe the artist gave the sitter something to occupy herself with for a longer session to paint. That's an interesting theory too, that maybe this woman has no relationship to the dog, but the, the artist wanted to give her something to keep her busy while he got all the lace and everything painted. Um, I like that. That's an interesting theory. So, okay, again, we don't know anything about this woman or who she is or what her story was, but I sort of alluded to, you know, if she lived today, if she was in 2021, what do you think, what do you think her role in society would be? Would she be a fashion model, an Instagram influencer? Um, what do you think? Yeah, Donna. Uh, when I see her, I think of the character in Legally Blonde, yes. Elle, because she had, when you said, pocketbook Laura that's I think she carried a, a her pocketbook or a purse with her dog and I think the dog the little dog's name was killer I'm not positive about that but um th that's what it made me think of it like the ultimate accessory yeah so yeah if you haven't seen Legally Blonde it's about a, a woman who goes to Harvard Law School but is very kind of preppy and into fashion and she carries her little chihuahua with her everywhere in her pink purse yeah I, I, I think I get that same vibe Donna which right. goes, so we can't underestimate this woman just because she's a fashionista she might also secretly have the talent to be a lawyer right it's very calculating <laughs> yeah I'm, so, I'm sorry Nancy shared Lady Gaga and John Anderson shared Paris Hilton I agree. Yes. yes. <laughs> 
you know, I could see Lady Gaga wearing a get up like this today, you know, and, and pulling it off on the red carpet. It feels very Gaga-esque. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> dog barking in the background. That's so perfect. <laughs> and Paris Hilton too, right? She also, I think she also carried around a chihuahua. Maybe, I'm not sure on the breed. It's been a while since I thought about Paris Hilton. <laughs> okay, so I want to... Um, compare this image to another that's hanging in the gallery just kind of immediately following it or a couple after which is oops and I keep forgetting to give you the uh the painting information I'm sorry like portrait of a young lady 18th century you're not going to get a lot of clues from that um but okay so I want to compare that one to this one this was painted a little bit later um but I think has a very different uh dy dynamic or feel uh, so again, we have a woman with her dog, but quite different. So what are your impressions of this portrait and this dog and this woman? The dog looks worried about her. Okay, so let me give you a little close up of the dog's face here. So, Kay, you think the dog looks worried about her. And what do you see that makes you say that? The way he's looking at her, the paw kind of protective on her skirt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she looks very sad okay okay so you're reading that he's this sort of almost comforting her protecting her is worried about her she looks sad and he's um got this lovely giant paw on her <laughs> leg there um as a, as a gesture of comfort does everyone agree with that assessment does anyone read her expression differently diane shared languid Ooh, languid yeah good one Good word. That is a good word. Good word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think there's, uh, you know, it's that it's just sort of that that S curve of her body. She's sort of laying back. Things, the the, the tonality of the painting is a little, little bit um, darker, hazier. There's that languidness to it, which I think is a is a great way of summing it up. Um, so, does everyone agree? She looks sort of, she looks sort of sad here. This sitter. Yeah. I love it. I love the dogs that are chiming in. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think I think I almost see sort of an air of like seduction as well. And maybe maybe that's not what the intent was, but I think maybe it's how her posture is, how she sort of braced herself on this chair and is staring straight out at us in this very intense way. Um, and then I see the dog is sort of adoringly looking at her um, as though everything, you know, man or beast who comes under her gaze is sort of captivated by her. Um, but it's interesting that the dog is so so prominently featured here, right? And we do have uh, a few more shares. Nancy oh. said that the dog wants to go outside and she is <laughs> tired. <laughs> and Faith also shared that the dog looks worried. She's so out of it, he won't get dinner. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've got some people putting themselves in the, the mindset of the dog. So the dog maybe needs to go out, needs attention, and she's too tired to go let him out again. I think dog owners can relate to that, the incessant in and out, back and forth, or that the dog is worried that he's very hungry and he's not going to get dinner. <laughs> yeah, I think, and again, if you have a dog, you can recognize that that stare, that intense stare into your face when they want something. So perhaps that's what um, is going on here. And she doesn't seem to be paying too much attention to the dog, but her hand is resting on the dog's back there. Um, one little detail I think is so funny. Uh, if you look at the size of the dog's paw versus her dainty little foot that comes down um, in this point, uh, it's it's quite funny how massive the dog is and how elegant and kind of petite she is here. And John Anderson is asking, are her legs hanging over the arm, the chair arm? I think, yeah, I think her legs are meant to be sort of coming out this way like these would be her thighs and then her her uh, shins coming down here um but that's maybe i'm reading it wrong does everyone does anyone see it differently that's how i see it okay yeah again a very sort of tenuous posture to hold for a, a portrait um hanging over the armchair instead of just sitting in it properly facing front kind of an interesting um an interesting choice on the part of the artist or the sitter so I found some interesting gossip about this woman. Uh, unlike the other portraits, we actually know who this is. So if we have any Pride and Prejudice fans or any Bridgerton fans here, I think you're gonna enjoy this. Uh, so this is Mrs. George Frederick Stratton. 
Um, that was, of course, her married name. This portrait was made in 1811 uh, by Thomas Lawrence, who was a quite uh, famous and respected portrait painter in Britain. Uh, he was associated with the Royal Academy of Arts. Um, very kind of prestigious. Uh, but anyway, so this is Mrs. Stratton. She was born Anne de Uze, was her uh, maiden name. And so I did a little Googling on, on, on Anne here. And what I found was, again, this feels like straight out of Jane Austen. Um, I'll just read you the relevant parts. So she had made a great marriage, right? She had a fortune of 39,000 pounds a year. Uh, she married George Frederick Stratton, who had an income of 7,000 pounds a year. Everyone thought it was a most suitable match, but the wretched man had spent his own, his wife's, and even his 86-year-old mother's money on elections and speculation. Not even his wife knew of his ruin until there was an execution in the house. I don't think they mean actual execution, but, you know, activity. And she discovered he had escaped to America, leaving her and his mother penniless. So... This painting uh, was made about six years after they were married uh, in, in 1811. Um, and then it's in the 1830s that he goes totally bankrupt, has spent her fortune, his own fortune and his mother's fortune. So he escapes to America where he ultimately dies shortly thereafter penniless. She goes on to live another uh, several, many more years, another 30 years um, and has to sort of pick up the pieces with this, this broken marriage <laughs> that he has, he, he has created for her. So. I was very interested to read all of that. Um, and to me, it sort of gave new insight into perhaps her expression, perhaps her relationship with this dog. Maybe he is more of a faithful companion than her husband was. Um, so it's kind of knowing that story, does that change how you are reading this portrait at all? Or does it just sort of confirm confirm what you what you thought? Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> this poor woman, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think I now that now that I look at her face again, I think I think she knows something is amiss. You know, maybe maybe she was a little blindsided when everything went down, but I think she has some sense that that something is going on here. And Diane shares foreshadowing the future sadness. Mm -hmm. And John Anderson shared it explains all the red. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. And dogs are good listeners. Yes. She yeah. can pour her ha heart out to him. <laughs> yes, I, think, I think that that real sense of genuine affection between dog and human here, this, you know, as, as we talked about the, the previous portrait, maybe that was just an accessory, something the artist gave her to hold on to. But here, this feels like a really kind of substantial relationship. So maybe she has spent a lot of time talking to this dog and he's been that support or that comfort that someone mentioned right there at the beginning. And again, if we're thinking about dogs as a sign of fidelity, you know, maybe this dog is more, more faithful to her than, than her other relationships. So interesting backstory to this one for sure. I did find as well when I was kind of reading about her, another portrait also by Thomas Lawrence, a little kind of a little sketch here. And here she is again. And so you can see she has that same sort of expression. I didn't find a date on this one, but you can see, you know, it really does it kind of captures her essence um, and you know, had painted her several times. Um, and here she looks a little bit more contemplative, but I still see that, that, that sense in her eyes that maybe something is amiss. Wow. So, so good, uh, there's, your, there's your fill of 19th century gossip for the day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I'm gonna move on to our last work or series of images. Um, some of you may have seen this one with me before. I think it's a very striking print. Uh, it's currently on view at the museum uh, in our Saito Kiyoshi show. So you can go see it in person if you'd like. But again, I'm just gonna give you a moment. Uh, this is very different from what we've been looking at previously. Uh, so what are your impressions of this, this scene? What are you noticing first? really skinny dog. <laughs> yes, yeah. So we started our day with a, a very lean uh, hunting or racing dog. And here we have a very, very skinny dog um, right here. Oh, it's just a series of a few lines, essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else? It, it kind of strikes me as, uh, as a sad scene. And, and I'm doing some interpretation here. But I, I, the woman, I, I, I see the person in the center there as, as a woman. And and she strikes me as sad and, and behind her, uh, what, what I thought was at first a church, but then I'm starting to think, well, could it be a tomb of, of a loved one or something like that? And that may, might be the reason for, for the sadness. 
Yeah, Howard, that's an interesting um, interpretation. I kind of has always have always assumed this is a church too, but you're right. It almost feels more like a tomb or a crypt or something like that. And it contributes perhaps to this sense of, of sadness. What is there anything in particular that gave you that, that feeling of sadness beyond um, the subject matter? Is there anything in the composition? Um, yeah, the, you know, even the, the, the dog is, is, has his back turned to what I identified as the tomb and, and the, uh, the person I identified as a woman, her, her, uh, her face is, is dark. So it, it, it has just kind of an ominous look to it. Yeah, yeah, I get that sense of that ominous sense. Absolutely. So the dog is kind of turned away from the tomb. The person is not engaging with us at all. And we almost seem to sort of like these, uh, this observer of the scene that feels very, very stark, very desolate. Um, great. Yeah. Other, other thoughts on this? Do you agree with Howard? Do you get a different vibe from this, this print here? John Anderson shared there is something Saito Se did when outside Japan, I believe. Mm -hmm. This is something, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is something he did outside of Japan, right. So this is a, a Japanese printmaker um, who lived and worked primarily in Japan, but also traveled all over the world, was very um, well known um, in his day, in his lifetime. Um, and this is a painting, or not a painting, sorry, a print that he made um, in Mexico, actually. So it's interesting, we have this kind of traditional Japanese woodblock medium um, applied to a scene set in Mexico. Um, and this was made in the 50s. Um, and is there anything in particular that would have made you think Mexican or, or John, how did you sort of place this outside of Japan? Were there any clues or did you just have some prior knowledge about the artist? Faith shared the cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, you're not gonna see it. And John had prior knowledge. John had prior knowledge, okay, yeah, I bet, I bet you've spent some time in that exhibition. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting composition, right? That sense we're getting, that desolation, um, and I think you know I, you may have seen the title "Stray Dog Mexico." I think it's interesting that this little dog here, that is to me almost just a sort of gestural afterthought, has become the thematic focus or the central focus of this print, at least in the title that has been given to it, "Stray Dog Mexico." What do you think the importance of the dog is, or is there is there a significance of the dog? Um, for this particular work and the, the interpretation of it. Laura? Yes. I remember this from last year, mm -hmm. this uh, image. And at, the, at that time, I felt the same as I do now. That, that dog, uh, we're familiar with Mexico and there are a lot of stray dogs in parts of Mexico and they're really just background material. I venture to say there isn't any particular meaning at all. Okay, yeah. So for for you, it's just you've spent some time in Mexico with a lot of stray dogs, yeah. kind of an afterthought, blend into the background, and so maybe it's just kind of what he saw and incorporated it in. Yes. Okay, sure. And if if that's the case, what is this? Is this tomb or this church the central idea? The person? Is it? I mean, yes. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And not the dog. Not the dog. Yeah. And Laura mm -hmm. on the right. Yes. It almost looks like it's the side of a stage, that black thing and then the brown underneath it. Mm -hmm. Like you oh, might be looking, here. Sorry. Yeah, like you might be looking onto a stage. I mean, I'm I see things probably that aren't there, but <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very it's kind of an interesting composition, right? Because it seems as though there's this hole cut out of it. So it's almost this this archway. Um, mm -hmm. with a, a stage or a ramp. Yeah, it, the sense of place is a little ambiguous, I think, which is part of the reason I find this image captivating because it's, you know, what what are we meant to be looking at? What are we meant to feel? Where are we meant to be? All of that, um, we can sort of puzzle out. And Faith shared that she thought it was to symbolize the suffering of the innocents. Mm, okay, to symbolize the suffering of the innocents because we have this little starving dog here um, who doesn't seem to be getting any sort of attention or care from anyone. Yeah, it could be, it could be. There's a there's a tradition, I, I think last year we talked about one of the interior scene of Peter's Kirk, um, a, a painting, a Dutch painting um, with all of these dogs inside a church space, kind of urinating on columns and just being, being dogs. So it's interesting to look at how dogs and sort of religion or places of spirituality um, intersect in different ways. And Diane shared that the dog could be faithful to deceased. Ah, okay. So going back to this idea of fidelity, and if this is a 
a graveyard or some sort of um, tomb area that the dog is being faithful to people who have passed. Interesting. Yeah. So this one's a little, this one's a little, a little grim, perhaps, depending on how you read it. Um, but I have one that's a little more whimsical by the same artist. So this is a much more obviously dog print, um, uh, more so than the, the the one we were just looking at. And I, I like this one because I think it just shows uh, Saito's style nicely. This dog has a lot of personality. Uh, Saito was a, a printmaker who was part of the creative movement where he was basically conceiving of a print, designing it, carving the blocks, executing the print, doing the entire process himself rather than having that um, kind of workshopped out to different people. Uh, so he he forced, you know, he oversaw the process from start to finish. And he was really interested in um, kind of modern aesthetics, um, this kind of very often whimsical take on things. He never went fully to abstraction, but he sort of danced around it um, and, and for, sort of just found the essential forms and shapes uh, and made these really kind of interesting prints. So here is a dog um, and I've got the information for you here, it's just called dog. Uh, but what Saito is actually best known for are his prints of cats. And I should mention his, uh, a big, big Saito Kyoshi show is on view right now at the museum. It's on view until August 15th and then it'll come down. Um, a, a really wonderful show curated by uh, Rhiannon Paget, who is our curator of Asian art. So if you wanna go see many of these works in person, they will be up. Uh, through August 15th, and then they will be resting for quite some time. Um, so this is a good chance to see them. Uh, but as I mentioned, Saito Kiyoshi was actually best known for his cat prints. And many of these are on view um, because we did have three or four people self-identify as cat people on the call. So I wanted to make sure we had something for them. Um, and I'll just show you a, a series of these. I, I, I love the background texture. I love the silhouettes here, the shadows. Um, and each one really has its distinct personality. I also like how Saito uses uh, the texture of the wood. He's printing, you know, woodblock prints um, to really inform his composition. You have this whole tangle of kittens here, um, or this one here, the, the Siamese cats who are very inquisitive and maybe a little coy. Um, and, again, John also, and John also added that cats do outnumber dogs in his prints. Yes, yes, he is much more of a cat printmaker than a dog printmaker. But I had to throw in the dog ones, you know, for the for the purposes of today's theme. But yes, he's much more known as, as a cat printmaker. Um, so that was basically all I had. I wanted to add on cats, even though this was a dog tour, so that our cat people felt included. Um, but are there other questions or comments that anyone would like to make before we wrap up today? Faith shared the comment that the cats all look like they've been fed. Yes. These are happy cats, I think. <laughs> yeah, and I can go, I've got, I can show you the other ones again. I like, I like these because this just feels so playful to me. They're all tangled up. You can't tell where one starts and the other ends. And John shared that the catalog is great. Yes, uh, yeah, Rhiannon, our, our curator of Asian art wrote a beautiful catalog. She has some essays in there as well as other guest scholars and that's available in the museum store. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Saito Kiyoshi, I should mention too, um, actually a week from today on August 3rd, we're having a virtual conversation uh, with uh, Charles Citrin, who is the major donor to the show, as well as another donor and um, a friend of Saito Kiyoshi, someone who knew him. Um, so it's gonna be a conversation with collectors and friends uh, next week. And that information's on our website. So if you wanna learn more, please feel free to join us for that one. So I guess I, might, I, I should end on an image of a dog. I shouldn't leave you hanging on cats. <laughs> complete the circle here. Um, but I just wanted to thank you all so much. It's nice to see you virtually. Um, we will be resuming in-person gallery talks starting in um, September or October. So you'll have those opportunities to be back in the galleries. And we're looking at doing some hybrid programs as well. Um, so you'll still be able to connect with us virtually if you prefer. So wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you very much. So much fun to have all of you. Thank you for your insights and your contributions. See you Always next a pleasure. Time.